For them, it comes from a different point of view. It comes from a point of view of liability. And they want to avoid liability because liability costs money. So we should all be appreciative of the job we have. They sort of have some, you know, safe guideline fences in there. And uh, you're sort of paid okay. And we should all be happy. <laughs> and then we go, there's a heck of a lot of issues that you don't pay attention to. Welcome to Out of Frame, a nerdy filmmaker podcast where I sit down with actors and creators from across the entertainment industry, discussing the successes and struggles within their stories. My name is Julian Stambouli, AKA the Nerdy Filmmaker. And today we are joined by Eleanor Noble, president of the Canadian Actors Union, whose incredible story includes a cross Canada theater trip, two years in war-torn Pakistan, and a constant battle for the rights and dignity of all Canadian performers. Hi, Eleanor. Hi, Julian. Thanks for coming on. Eleanor, where did you come from? Ooh, well, I am a first-generation Canadian. Mm -hmm. So my family immigrated over here from the UK. Okay. My dad is a Brit, and my mom is Syrian-Iraqi. And, um, yeah, I have a sister and two brothers. They were all born in the UK, and then they came over here, and I was born. So here. So here. here. Yeah. So you're here. Here. Uh, Were you born like... In downtown Montreal or in one of the surrounding no, areas? No, I was born on the South Shore in a little town called Candiac that at that time uh, was barely on the map. Mm-hmm. But then I think uh, maybe in my teens, we got a McDonald's. And so it, uh, it boomed. It made the map. <laughs> it made the map. And, uh, and now, like, a lot of the rich hockey players live there because they expanded Candiac. It just kept growing and growing and growing. Mm. And they built a whole section of mansions, and that's where they like to. McDonald's leads to Burger King. Burger King right. leads to mansions. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's not, still not even as fancy as that. We still just have the McDonald's. <laughs> it's like so small. Well, the richer section has like a new section with like a pharma pre and stuff. But uh, yeah, yeah. And so, what was growing up like in Candiac? What um, what were your what were your hobbies like growing up? It was a beautiful place to grow up. Actually, we had um, we had a nice big backyard. My best friend lived right behind me. We met when we were two and three, and we're still best friends to this day. Um, Which was interesting because we were one year apart, same as in school. Um, So we had different groups of friends, but in the summertime, we hung out with each other every single day. And then we're sort of like, you know, blood sisters. We're we're, uh, unconditional love because we've been through everything together. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of the first to jump off every bridge and then she'd follow and got into lots of trouble. Um, so you were, were you a troublemaker growing up in general? Mm, you in know, it was, and... it was kind of different times, you know, so, so my friend and I would spend the summers going to the local park swimming pool and in our community there were more public swimming pools and there were houses almost. So it was a real community <laughs> thing. Like my siblings were all lifeguards. I trained to become a lifeguard, but then I took a different path. Um, so we all did swimming lessons in the morning and that kind of thing, and then hang out at the pool. And in those days, you didn't really have any parental guidance. So, um, you know, wine coolers came out around that time. And (laughs) my friend's mom would like pack a little picnic and send us off to the pool and we'd open it up and we'd be like, Ooh, we have Durango wine coolers. And we were like, wow, these are so delicious. And we're like nine and 10 years old sitting under a tree drinking (laughs) Wine coolers. Anyway, her mother didn't realize it was alcohol in it, but we were like, this and you didn't, you didn't tell her. No, because we were like, this is so cool. These are so tasty. They were like Durangos were. I don't think they exist anymore, but they were like one of the first wine coolers, and they tasted like they were beer coolers. They were malt with flavor. So okay. if you like peach malt or you know, but they were like four percent alcohol. I know we were it's nine and still, ten years old, but enough. it was. Uh, that's great. Yeah, we, yeah, it was good. And then, you know, we just hang out all day long outside. And yes, yeah, there were no parents just to eat meals. It was so free back then. When I, so, I mean, we always had family dinner, right? Like that was, but um, yeah, from pretty early on, I don't know when, the, when it started, but my, you know, I had seven up for Sprite. And then my dad would pour a little bit, like a little dash of wine in there. He'd be like, it's a spritzer. Well, that's it. We grew up, uh, we grew up having alcohol with dinner and <clears throat> whatever. I think I was like four years old drinking creme de menthe out of a little tiny glass and being very fancy. But, you know, as a European lifestyle, it mm-hmm. was passed on to uh, 
to over here and uh, kind of unique, I guess, in a way. Mm. But my friend's parents were the same. Mm. They're Italian and Polish, so. Very good. Yeah. And so, um, so you wanted to be a lifeguard. Uh, was there any other kind of path? Did you have any idea you were going to end up in the entertainment industry eventually? Absolutely. I knew that from oh, really? very, very, very young age. Like, I think I was about six years old. I saw some Fred Astaire movie, and I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do. Did you used to like put on plays or little skits for your for your family? We did. My my friend and I would uh, you know we'd we'd have opera hour. We'd have play hour. We you know we were always playing imaginative. We we're really into so many like fantasy worlds and stuff like that. So yeah, so playing around was really really part of our you know role playing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then when I was in school, um, we had like this Christmas pageant and I played Susie Snowflake mm. and that was it. The role you were born to play really. Yeah. 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 You mean yeah, a, yeah. yeah. It was the whole thing. Had to sing up there and can you do sing the well? actions and I think I can sing. Okay. You know? Well, we all think we can sing. Yeah, but. of course. <laughs> Usually the ones that can sing are the ones that don't think they can sing. So right. the rest of us just <laughs> take up space at karaoke. I can belt out a tune if I have to. Mm -hmm. So you went through schooling. Did you go to, you went to university here? I went to the Dome. You went to the Dome. Uh, a lot of people on this podcast so far has gone to the Dome. Um, I mean, what was that experience like? Um, it was intense. It was, in those days, way harder than anything I was going to face in my career. It was very insular, and I uh, still have my, some of my best friends from that time, mm -hmm. for sure. It was extremely like a bonding experience for all of us, and long, long, long hours, relentless, uh, but an education I wouldn't change for anything because it built a lot of resilience, and at the Dome, back in those days, I know it's changed slightly, but uh, they... They still do crews and running the show, but in, in, in those days, you would, in first year, you were on a crew for the three productions of the final year. Okay. So you were their crew, and in the second year, and you put on one performance, one play. And then the second year, you put on two plays, but then you are running the crews of the third year performances, and then the third year, you are just doing the performances, and you're pampered, um, and then you help out with the, with the second year and first year's uh, plays. Yeah. You help them with the, the, the crew stuff. So a lot of volunteer, obviously we weren't paid to go to school, but a lot of our extra time and effort put into it. And when we graduated, I would say that most domies who went through that process uh, are very respectful of crews and the other side of the camera, the other side of the, you know, backstage people. We believe more in a collaboration. Mm -hmm. Can't speak for everybody, but I think that's the general feeling from a domie. We get a lot of feedback on that too, so yeah. kind of proud to hold that badge. Yeah. Whenever I'm talking with someone who wants to go into filmmaking, um, something I always say is that first they should be crew and second they should be editor. Um, and this is even if they want to act because it gives you not only a respect for the whole process but awareness for the whole process. So I think that's really cool that... I wonder if they still do that. I hope they still do that because they sounds do like a do really it. Good they do do it. Super intense. Memorizing, memorizing, memorizing all the time. Like all the time, you have to prepare monologues for the next day, even though you're painting a set for somebody. Or yeah, but, but do, it's you, awesome. do you eat that stuff up? Do you like? Do you love the process of leading up to a performance? All the rehearsal, all of the, all of the memorization, all the work that goes into it, or for you is, you know, is the performance the main thing? Like, are you? Are you oh man, who you can't the have the performance without the process. Mm -hmm. I think that that's kind of the difference between film and television and theater. In theater, you get to indulge in the process mm -hmm. before you go out on stage yeah. and perform something. It doesn't mean you have every answer by opening night, but there's a constant development in the repetition. I prefer the word in French, repetition, because mm -hmm. in English it's rehearse, and there's like the word hearse. <laughs> And we do feel like we're crawling to opening night most times. But, uh, but no, like the process of, of rehearsing, I think, is such a magical thing. It really trains you to be prepared for film and television because you don't have that. You might mm -hmm. run a scene for blocking mm -hmm. on film and television, but you're not necessarily rehearsing. And yeah. even when I did a TV series, we were, you know, we'd have a table read, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. It's like a day. Not even. It's a few hours. Yeah. <laughs> And you can ask questions and 
just get the, you know, the arc of the story and then you're shooting everything out of sequence. Yeah. And if you're not, you know, a main character in a film or on a TV series, you're a day player and you're not having that process. So you mm -hmm. just have to come in and knock it out of the park on whatever, however many takes you're allowed to do. Right. So did you stick within the kind of theater sphere for, for a while or did you know you right away wanted to make the jump towards um, uh, recorded media? Film and television? Yeah. So back in those days, Canada was still really built on a theater basis and everybody had this philosophy that, you know, you'd build your theater resume and then you'd build your film and TV resume and then you'd go to Hollywood. And so there was this process and people actually earned a living off of theater back then. And Imagine. I, was, I know, it's kind of crazy. And I was on the cusp of that. And so what I did after I, gra I, a year after I graduated, or about a year and a half after I graduated, Equity used to put out a booklet of all the theaters across the country, and there were a ton of them. And they were all equity houses, which is obvious. You could mm -hmm. like hop from theater to theater mm -hmm. and make a living. Equity being the, the um, union for theater. And uh, so I took it upon myself to start writing early when I was graduating theater school. I started writing to all these theaters across the country saying, I just graduated from theater school and I would like to be part of your season and da, da, da. And then the second year when I wrote, some of them recognized me and they said, well, when are you going to be in town? And mm -hmm. that was in Winnipeg. So I was like, uh. So I quickly organized myself and I hopped on a bus. I, I got a, a bus pass to go across the country on Greyhound. Okay. And I stopped everywhere that I could got off the bus and auditioned in all the theaters that I could across the country. Holy moly. Yeah. And I got all the way to Vancouver and then I got, uh, I got an audition out of my general audition tour. And I had to say it was a pretty amazing experience. Everybody was super nice and accommodating. It was incredible because I'd be like, I wrote to you and I'm coming to town. I'll be there tomorrow. No cell phones back in those days, no emails, anything like that. And I would just show up at the theater and they would they were so happy to see me do a general audition and that I took the time out of my, my life to come and meet them. And so, um, yeah, so I got a, a proper audition for a specific play. I drove from Vancouver to Calgary and I auditioned for it at the time. Uh, Neil Monroe was directing it. Uh, he's now passed away, but he was considered one of the best directors in the country at that time. And he cast me in this play. And back then, except for Montreal, the other theater companies across the country would do co-productions. So New Brunswick would do a production with Winnipeg or whatever, and they would split the cost of it. And okay. it was nice because there was this sort of cross-Canada thing of having actors perform on different stages and having quality actors perform across the country. Then I had this opportunity, and I ended up getting the role on this play, and it ended up being the biggest uh, co-production. Co-production. It was a quad pro. What? So, yeah. So I nailed like a big job right away, which was completely intimidating at that time. I toured for six months with some really top actors who most of them I think have passed away now. But uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I felt like I was mentored and learned from the best, mm -hmm. some of the best in the country. And it was a play called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, A Love Story. It was adapted... Which one were you? From the original <laughs> story. It was, it was a bit of a crazy, crazy of the times as well. It was adapted from the original story by uh, James Nichols, I think it was. And um, he had created that, that Dr. Jekyll was married, and he was now a widow, and he had a 16-year-old daughter Aww. who he lusted after. But he felt he was very torn with his lust and how wrong it was. So he created a young Mr. Hyde. It was really him. Oh my God. Who could, you know, make love to his daughter. It was Yikes. completely scandalous. I played the prostitute that he kept running to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, you know, unleash his urges. And um, yeah, so there was a lot of crazy stuff on that stage. I, you know, there was nudity and, Love making and Felicia and all kinds of crazy stuff that I, I was, uh, I was in a, I was very fortunate working with the people that I worked with that it was such a safe, respectful, set. respectful because environment. That kind of project would be, um, 
heavily scrutinized right now. Uh, Absolutely. Well, it was heavily scrutinized back then okay. as well. But no, we, we did really well. I never felt for a second I was doing anything that I wasn't comfortable doing, right. anything like that. I was given a lot of... Um, a lot of tools to handle the situation by the director, by my mm -hmm. peers, because I was so young at the time. Yeah. But nobody pushed me around. It was quite an amazing thing. It was equal ground for everybody. I learned so much from that, from that situation. The, the director at one point, because I was very shy and a, a bit intimidated by the process at the beginning, and he put his arm around me and he walked me. Uh, we were walking. He was like, come here. Let's just, let's, let's chat. And it's something that I've carried with me for the rest of my life, is he said, you know what? Everything's okay. We are all on the same team. I'm the captain of the team, and you're one of the players, and we all have to perform. So when we're up there on that stage, like, I'm in the same soup as you. So he's like, take a breath. It's all good. There's no, you know, hierarchy or whatever. We're all the same level, and we're working together to come out with it. And it totally um, opened me up. Mm -hmm. Because I was so close, you know, and he could tell. He was trying to tap into me, and I was like, yep, yep. nope, nope. And it, it, yeah, changed things for me forever. Because I was like, that's right. There is no hierarchy. It yeah. is a team effort. And I think that sets the standards for what you'd probably deem acceptable in a project or set, which will come to play probably later in this conversation. Um, what a wonderful first experience. Were you, were you already breaking into voice at that point? Because I think that a lot of your mythology as a performer here in the city is that you are one of the leading animation voice actors in the city and have quite a resume. So were you already in that space? So yeah, so I started voice work when I was in theater school. Mm -hmm. So I, I had already had a toe in. At the same time, a television series had started called Are You Afraid of the Dark? Oh. And I was in my third year at theater school and uh, I was cast in one of the first, oh, the first episodes, episodes, yeah, oh. as a lead character. Whoa. So I was like, ding, you know, oh so like, so I had already um, done all of that. Like I actually had my ACTRA membership, and back then it was six credits before I became equity. Which is interesting because I don't think schools let you audition now while you're I in know. school. Well, it was so. a little rough. I did. Mm. There was consequences to oh, me. Okay. Although the school set up the auditions once I got yeah. the role and I had to miss a couple of days. They were like, you're out of here. So I did not do the, that. I was kicked out of my last play, but uh, I still graduated because oh, I ended up great. putting on a one woman show. But Are you fair of the dark? Synonymous with Canadian television. I know. What a, uh, an epic show that was. Um, that's awesome. Well, great. great. So, you, so you did that, but you were already... Um, so you're already in the union, and so now you say you're dipping your toes into voice work. When you come back to, to Montreal, you know, what's, your, what's your acting career looking like? What do you? So now I'm <clears throat> starting to do way more voice, voice work. Uh, I just had that voice at that time that mm -hmm. was fitting everything. And I was very proactive. As you could tell, I hopped on a bus and went across Canada and mm -hmm. you know, read all these letters and ended up working. I was also very proactive way at the beginning. I think I was one of the first people, I think Mark Camacho would vouch for it, um, of shadowing people to watch dubbing. Mm -hmm. Dubbing was a little bit more of a more intense process back then because it was on a film reel and there was oh, a whole man. thing. It wasn't digital where it's so easy to go back and forth now. You so really you couldn't mess up. You can fuck up. Nope. You have to nail it. So uh, my first few times dubbing, doing original voice was a dream. That was a total dream, and I would—I had already done that. I did The Magical Adventures of Quasimodo was my first big one, and I played Esmeralda. <laughs> but uh, once I started getting into the dubbing world, what would happen if you're when you're beginning, and it was so intense back there, we used to work with a lot of people in the room, a lot of other actors, and when it was your turn to go up to the microphone, all I would hear is my heartbeat in my throat. <laughs> And I'd be like, oh, my God, I really have to get over these nerves. So that's when I started shadowing, and I knew Mark. Mm -hmm. So um, previously, he was a big inspiration and, and a reason why I went to theater school and mm -hmm. followed my career choice because he, he was doing it. He was older than I was. Mark Camacho being a, an actor and a, and a very prominent voice director in the city. Yeah. yeah. Back then, he wasn't directing. He was just acting. Oh, okay. And he was, um, he was full of drive and inspiration and... and uh, so he, I, he was sort of my mentor in everything. I owe a lot to Mark 
and I would contact Mark and say, I really want to, can you let me know when you're in studio? May I watch you work? And just so I could get over the nerves of it, mm -hmm. I know how to dub. I just, I have nerves. So he would let me come in and watch. And it didn't take too many times mm -hmm. before I got comfortable. And I think Mark is responsible for, I don't want to say launching, but at least facilitating the start of a lot of people's voice careers, in my, mine included. The first audition I ever did for voice was, well, for, for dubbing was for Mark. And, and I landed that role and it was a three season show and a lot of my uh, experience going into it and my, my confidence came from the fact that he's also very chill when he's directing, um, so, which is very comforting. I have a question. I have, as a, as a voice actor, especially when I'm doing cartoons, this is more of a cartoon thing, I have like my bread and butter voices. I have like my two voices other than my own voice that they always ask, right? I'm always the, the nerd, you know, mm -hmm. you talk like this, or like the bully, right? Do you have your bread and butter voices uh, that you normally, when I you come do. in and you go, you want the this, and they say yes? I do. I, I would say that I have my three bread and butter voices. I've got my little girl, and then I have my boy, mm -hmm. and then I have the mother. Mm -hmm. And from a... You're like, can we hear us? So, like, my little girl would be up here a little bit, and then my boy would be more down here, and then my mother would call you to dinner. So, and often I get to play those three roles at the same time, which is great. Oh my God, that voice. That was great. That was fun. All right. Hey, thank you. On behalf of the audience, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> It's just a tiny clip. But yeah, but I mean, as you do it more and more often and you're thrown into every situation where you're playing thousands of animals, you come up with a lot of different voices and ranges and then ranges within those ranges. And mm -hmm. so it's fun. It's, it's a great way to be creative. And then when you do live action, you got to really turn the tables around. Yeah, and ground it. On the whole thing and ground it. But that's what we do for film and television anyway, right? Like, you're not really going to get the part if you're auditioning for... Yeah. A serious movie acting like a cartoon. So around that time, you know, killing it as a voice actor, still doing TV appearances. Um, I did a TV actor. series. Which series? It was called The Mystery Files of Shelby Wu. Mm -hmm. It was for Nickelodeon mm -hmm. and YTV. Oh, my God. Uh, Shelby Wu is like a Nancy Drew. Uh, same sort of concept, solving crimes. And I was her best friend. And Pat Morita was her grandfather. How long was the series? We did one season. Okay. They'd done a season in Florida, and then they came up to do the second season in Montreal, and then it didn't get called back, and everybody was very disappointed. I bet. But they did a book series, so I'm on the cover of all these books. <laughs> I had really short hair, so nobody recognizes me, but... Like photograph or, yeah. or, or likeness drawing? No, no, for the photograph. And did you get residuals for your photograph on the books? No. No, what? It was shitty pay back then. And they flew me down to Florida to do a game show called Figure It Out, and the panelist next to me was Coolio. Oh, man. And now he's no longer with us, but uh -huh. he was so funny. We laughed so hard, the two of us. Mm. Yeah. Did you figure it out? You know, I just recently watched it on, on, uh, on YouTube. I got slimed a lot. <laughs> what it was, was like it, the hardest. What was it with YTV shows or those shows and slimy people? Oh, it was people? terrible. Like it, goes, like it goes down your back oh. into your underwear, and then you have to keep like running out and like washing it yeah, off and getting into your next costume. Dumping and slime on people. Cold and yeah. sticky. Oh, it's yeah. weird, but it was fun. And so I think around that time you were married, is that? So then I got, so after the TV series, yeah, I got married about five years later. Okay. My, my husband <clears throat> got transferred to Pakistan to do a two-year posting as a diplomat. Okay. And it needed to be accompanied with a, a spouse or spouse. Um, government postings where you can either go alone or, you know, you have to take a spouse. So he very kindly asked me if I would join him mm. and then said it would be a great opportunity. Where had you met, by the way? Uh, we actually went to high school together. Cute. We were friends in high school, but we hadn't seen each other for eight years and bumped into each other and uh, fell in love. Mm. So, so, yeah, so it was kind of at a tricky time in my career because I was on such a great run with all my voice work and everything. Mm -hmm. But everybody was extraordinarily supportive and said, go. And when you come back, you won't lose your spot. Mm. And I didn't 
lose my spot, which was really amazing. I'm, I will forever be in gratitude for that, that I was able to leave for two years and come back and that my reputation and all the work I had done previously for, you know, years and years and years had, had remained once I got back and people were happy to see me and I was was super happy to see everybody and get back into studio. But yeah, so I was there between 2007 and 2009. And at that time, um, Pakistan was considered one of the most dangerous countries in the world. So it was a really, really uh, intense and interesting two years of my life. Um, I'll tell you the one thing that I learned from it that helped me in my career was I had started to develop stage fright. Mm-hmm. Because one time at the center door, I blanked out. <laughs> I blanked out for a really long time. <laughs> And nobody, nobody could help me on, on stage. They were all looking at me like, you know, and then they apologized as they rightly should, because I'm like, what happened? Like, at least like throw me a line, a word. Everybody was like, we all blanked out at the same time. Oh no! There was like four other people on stage with me and I was pacing back and forth going anyway. Um, so that instilled that crazy fear. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's awful. Stage fright is an awful thing to, to carry. And, and once in a while on film or television, when that clack would go down, my heart would, Mm-hmm. race a bit and I had a lot of trouble like I would always control it and find a way but it started making me feel like I wasn't enjoying the process as much because it was so intense and I was very grateful to have all my voice work to lean on anyway I go to Pakistan for two years um as much as it was the most phenomenal experience of my life there was also um you know quite a few bombings that happened during that time and and uh always this sort of risk uh, of unpredictability, just living there because anything could happen at any time, anywhere, and you weren't sure where it was. Uh, I did not live in fear there uh, because you can't. You can't live in 24-hour fear. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't like the result of the bombs, but I, I was okay with how I lived it. And when I came home um, and I, I got cast in a play... And I was rehearsing, and then I started to bring back all my old, my old uh, idiosyncrasies of fear and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I just stopped and went, wait a second. I survived two years in Pakistan, with, like driving by bombs going off and stuff. Why am, I fear, why am I fearing missing a line, messing up a line? I've been in the audience where people mess up on stage all the time, and I love those shows. Mm-hmm. Those are shows where I'm like, oh, did I, I was there that night when the bat was flying around or whatever, right? Or, so uh, instantly that stage fright went away, mm-hmm. and that was a huge relief for me. So it brought me to another level in you know, this long journey we have in our career. I was so relieved to let go of that. So now doesn't mean I don't have nerves, but I have healthy nerves. Mm-hmm. I don't have irrational, mm-hmm. ridiculous nerves. Yeah. So in 2008, um, there's only two hotels in, in Islamabad. That's where I was living. That's the capital of Pakistan. And uh, there's a Marriott Hotel, which is a Western hotel, and the Serena Hotel, mm-hmm. which is um, of the Middle East. And uh, so the Marriott Hotel, because the Western Hotel, is often targeted by... Taliban, Al Qaeda, and of course, there's no warning when there's a terrorist attack. That's why it's called a terrorist okay. attack. Um, but one day, I was supposed to be going to the Marriott Hotel mm-hmm. to have dinner. Uh, they, they had a sushi restaurant. It's the only place in town you could get sushi. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I was uh, I was going to go to the French club afterwards because they had a dance party. Didn't happen in the end. But uh, anyway, my, my plans got sidetracked because mm-hmm. my neighbor uh, would drive, drive us to parties and stuff. And so got invited over to uh, his place to have dinner instead. And he was supposed to go pick somebody up at the Marriott Hotel. But he was going to make arrangements for somebody else to pick them up and mm-hmm. all this stuff. And so I was like, OK, yeah, that's a good plan. And arrive at his, at his place and we're preparing the food and about to eat and then kaboom 10 tons of dynamite hits the Marriott hotel at exactly the same time that we would have all been there so it was pretty high intense Mm. um they had barriers to get into everywhere so a truck had managed to to infiltrate the boundaries of Islamabad get in with 10 tons of dynamite hit the barrier at the hotel 
people, people that I knew and loved, uh, were running towards the truck because a little flame had started and they wanted to help the driver. And instead, the whole thing just blew up and it was just a massive crater and the hotel was on fire. Um, the person that <clears throat> my neighbor was supposed to pick up, he was at the window looking out and looked at his watch and went, okay, my lift will be here. And so he just got to the door and got blown out into the hallway. He was okay. If he had wow. stayed at the window, he would have been dead. Um, the person who was picking him up um, was no joke on his way to the Marriott and looked down at his shirt and went, I can't go to the French club like this. It's just a stupid shirt. Turned around to go change his shirt, so he missed it. Uh, and so it was just this weird series of events. But, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the French club canceled their dance party. But, <laughs> but it was nerve wracking. We were in lockdown for a very long time. So, hey, when we went through COVID, I was like, ah, I've been there, been, been there, there a that. couple of times. Um, yeah, it was a, mm -hmm. it was a, a soul shaking experience it's like you didn't get on that plane that crashed yep. because something happened that caused you to not get on that plane and then you live in this weird survival's guilt kind of thing yep. but uh yeah so yeah that was part of my life which ultimately helped me get over stage reasons <laughs> because it's sort of indescribable and I, and I don't have any 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 advice for anybody to get over stage fright because it has to be your own process. Yeah, you know I can't say well go to a go to a country like that and you know or <laughs> scare yourself <laughs> really narrowly, badly. Barely escape death and yeah uh, start hand gliding and once you see that that's you know once you get over that fear <laughs> no you have to find your own you have to find what what is the source yeah. of the fear and then why are you still having the fear and how can you break the pattern of the fear because it's just a cycle we get into cycles of yeah. of habits that work against us right so but each person has to find their own on that got it have you been to, back to pakistan since i wish i could go back i haven't been mm. i want to it's my goal to go right. back one day i loved it and yeah it was and i loved all the people that i met there and this it's an incredible country i mean it's beautiful mm -hmm. it's beautiful but no mm -hmm. well thank you for sharing that story um so um adjacent to performing you have been on uh, montreal's branch of actor council uh for some time now um when when was your first term uh, when did you first join the montreal branch council so I got on Montreal. I, I started as an alternate, I think, in 2005. Mm -hmm. And then I became a branch counselor. Uh, back in those days, there wasn't a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. So we never held votes because there weren't enough people. We were begging people to be on council. And uh, so when I went away for the two years, I was still in touch. Mm -hmm. Uh, we didn't have Zoom meetings. It didn't exist back then. But um, but when I came back, I was still on council because there were still not enough people to, uh, to fill those to roles. Fill those roles. Yeah. And that was great because I've always had this sort of activist side of me and wanting to be involved. I could not wait when I was in theater school. I couldn't wait to become an actor member and an equity member so mm -hmm. I could show everybody my card and say I'm a professional. Yeah. Yeah. So so I've always held a lot of pride for, for being a union member. Mm -hmm of both my unions, uh, of both the unions. And, uh, <clears throat> and I like to be involved because I was, I always felt there were things we could do to improve things. Yeah. At least I can only speak to the Montreal branch, but you know, we are, first off, we're all volunteers, um, but we're also very um, willing to talk to people about what actually happens. So, I mean, for, for someone who might not know anything about what a council does, you know, with an ACTRA or what a meeting looks like or what kind of things happen? Like, how can you summarize what a union council like Montreal ACTRA does? So a union council will s specifically focus on that area's work mm -hmm. and their membership. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff trickles down from the national, uh, from, 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 the national section of the union trickles down to that. We share a collective agreement across the country mm -hmm. for all our different agreements that we have. And then, uh, so for example, Montreal would make sure that we are abiding by those and we uh, try to engage the membership as much as possible because it's a membership-led union. Mm -hmm. And 
part of the council's job is to do just that. And I have to say that over my duration of time of being on Montreal Council, it has changed significantly. It's not that um, we didn't have a good council before. It's just the environment changed, the way everybody did things changed. I don't know if it had something to do with uh, social media connecting people more and finding out more, and then you're more curious about it. But um, as as council sort of uh, changed up, a new generation came in, all of a sudden there were committees and lots of committees and lots of involvement and us engaging members to do workshops and, and mixers and meeting each other and really becoming more sociable within our branch to learn about each other and to strengthen who we are and to promote our talent here in Montreal as mm -hmm. best we can to casting who are in charge of casting productions that come from all over or locally or whatever to to promote us and and so i would say that that's that's the most thing and that we are and that we you know we do political lobbying and and um yeah but mostly each branch has has their membership and we look after that and then the overall umbrella is under national i mean i've i've only been a member of council this is my, my third term but even from when i used to go to agms for some reason i love agms um, I've always loved them. I don't know what's wrong with me. But They're awesome. I've always loved them. Uh, That's what brought me in in the first place. I was like, what is this? Yeah. And a lot of people are not interested in that stuff, but increasingly a lot of people are. And so I don't, yeah, I don't quite know what that shift is. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's just also that like things like social media is starting to put control into, um, into performers hands. Um, and so they're now more curious about what is actually happening for them. There's also like, um, it's harder now, I think, to be an actor. Correct me mm. if I'm wrong. No? Um, uh, I wanted to be part of the club. You okay. know? It was yeah. like, when I heard the first AGMs happening in my, my early 20s, I was yeah. like, what is this? I, like, I, I want to meet the other professionals mm -hmm. like me. And then I learned a lot about, and you know, when I was in my early twenties, not everything mm -hmm. made a lot of sense to me. Yeah. On on some of the levels, because it wasn't a thing of importance at that time. I was earning money, and yeah. that was what was important to me. But, uh, but, but as time goes on, and you learn the intricacies and how it relates to your life, and how we need all these things to have a sustainable livelihood. Yeah. It's really important. It becomes more and more important. And I'm happy that I started like way, way, way back. Yeah. But I mean, I guess maybe one, what I'm trying to say is that like, I know that Montreal has always been a hub for film, um, at least a Canadian hub. It's like the third or fourth hub, yeah. let's say, um, just by numbers, you know, uh, we're great because we can always also represent Europe or whatever because of our architecture. Um, it's a great video game city and it's a great voice city. I think that, I mean, like all activism, there's not activism when things are going like super, right. Right? right? Yeah. It's when people start to notice problems with usually within their own like, right. account or their own life. And then there's uh, so many reasons why these are, these are challenging times. And a large part of that being, unfortunately, the language laws yeah. uh, in the city. COVID as well had a huge hit. I, I think it's actually a great byproduct that members are starting to be a lot more active in in getting to know what's happening and educating themselves and all that kind of stuff. You are also Montreal's vice president. Um, how many, is this, this is your third term, second term as vice president? I think it's the third term. Third term. Right? Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of, of, of added responsibilities are put onto you for that and, and how has the process been for you so far? Simon does really great work and he like he's great being at the helm of mm -hmm. everything and then I'm there to step in when he's unavailable mm -hmm. so um, I don't have to do that much in that regard being vice president but we do have uh, executive decisions that we have to make sometimes on the fly mm -hmm. uh, and and I you know step in for him when he's unavailable but otherwise I leave him to do his job because he's so good at it <laughs> And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't need to, but we're, but you know, we're in contact. We talk all the time. And yeah. Montreal is such an interesting city because 
it it has changed so much. There was this this time when we were sort of Nickelodeon YTV capital, mm-hmm. and everybody in the city was working because there were all these TV series. Yeah, but we still do, considering the amount of actors that are in Montreal and the amount of work that we get compared to, let's say, the amount of actors performers there are in Toronto with the amount of work they get. Mm -hmm. So our opportunities are pretty good here. Mm -hmm. Um, I know we definitely have times where we're all auditioning like crazy. We don't necessarily get on to these newer things. I do find there's a shift in that, that when it was YTV Nickelodeon crazy, we were all working major lead parts with like always 100% consideration for us playing those roles. Mm -hmm. And now we're fighting more to play those roles and not just do the one line, the one word. Mm -hmm. So there I do see a little bit more of a challenge and that is something that we're constantly working on. That's when I wanted to start casting standards Mm -hmm. in Montreal, which was the first uh, across Canada, first in North America that we know of where performers met with agents and casting in the same room to discuss stuff. So this is a committee that was started with an actor. Did you start it alone? Did you start it with one of the other council members? It took me quite a few years. Um, I kept wanting to start something like this. I kept saying we need to have more communication. Uh, I feel that we're small in Montreal. We're just the right size to be able to have this kind of communication because we already all know each other very well. And uh, I pushed for it and pushed for it. It wouldn't happen. It wouldn't happen. And then finally, one time when we were doing our workshop of preparation in our new, our new term, uh, this was before I became vice president, um, um, I said it for like the hundredth time. And then, you know, Thor, Thor backed it up. So Mr. <laughs> Thor Bishoprick, past president of Na- Actor National and past vice president of Actor Montreal. Um, so why, why did it take, what was the pushback to it? Things changed in our council. Mm. You know, there was uh, there were a lot of established performers on council that didn't feel the necessity for us to do this thing that I felt completely differently about. And then council sort of shifted, and by the hundredth time that I said it, it started to resonate. And so then it was put forward and accepted, and then we, we started. Mm-hmm. And we didn't really know where to start. Because we're like, well, we've never had a committee like this before. So we know that what the issues are, but how do we go about tackling these issues and in what way? So what we did was we sat down and we came up with a survey for performers. We started there. So we sent out a survey to Montreal performers asking them about their audition process and their relationships with their agents and how they feel in the city. And we got all this intel. And then we went and did one-on-ones with quite a few agents and all the casting, and we exchanged information back and forth. We asked a lot of questions. We asked, what do they need from our membership? And we said, here's what our membership is saying. Mm -hmm. We didn't point anybody out. The surveys are all anonymous anyway, so there's nobody pointed out. Um, If anything, I thought, oh, my God, I'm never going to work in this city again. (laughs) But, no, we always try to take a, a positive, encouraging approach at the same time as trying to be honest to say we want to work together and collaborate and make this city shit hot (laughs) and and have work and I really wanted a reputation of us being like a boutique city yeah heard me say that before Mm -hmm. where people come and they go yeah we know it's a small pool but it's the creme de la creme we know what we're gonna what we're gonna get and what we're gonna get is really good quality because there's amazing actors here yeah uh uh, it, and I think what's also really important that you that you uh, to, to, for the success of this kind of thing, and also it is important for our membership, is to not only get our information to the casting agents and the talent agents, but to get the feedback from the casting and talent agents back to the performers. You know, um, we have a code of conduct and we have whatever. Those are not always followed. No. And I think it's important for the actor community to know that there are things expected of them that are not being met because if they're not following that then reputation gets damaged that's right Um, so i think that in itself i've sat in 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 a couple of those meetings and it's always very um eye-opening both sides you know um and uh you know we as performers love to get into our own little 
bubble and well and we're a unique culture in Montreal mm -hmm. for sure it's different from Vancouver it's different from Toronto Montreal has its own speed its own way and it was good for us to hear look this is what the rest of the country is doing now we can do what we want to do but we have to be mindful of 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 an expectation as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that means we need to lose who we are, but we do need to sort of balance it out and earn the reputation, put it on the table of what we actually really want. Yeah. Because that will keep empowering us and getting the work and building our, mm -hmm. who we are yeah. as performers. And I think something else that's really important, if, uh, if I can toot your horn for a little, little second here, but I think, uh, oh, mine? Uh, what I think is also important is that, you know, you've talked about the shift in the people in council and, and you know, when it comes time or for voting. I'm talking about ACTRA Montreal Council, but this applies for any vote yeah. to put someone in any kind of power. Is um, It's important for it to not to be a popularity contest, but to actually try to learn more about the people that you're voting for because you are a extremely successful performer here and you like you said maybe the reason that this committee never got support was because the people who were maybe pushing against it weren't feeling the importance of it but you recognize the importance of it because you're connected and hearing and sympathetic to what the general actor pool is feeling Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And so it does not benefit your career personally in any way to be doing this kind of stuff. In fact, you're even nervous that you're talking <laughs> back to casting directors that is going to affect you. Yeah. But I think that it's important that we're always electing people who are actually speaking to um, and, and supporting the voices of the people that are electing us, you know? Yeah, yeah um, for sure. And, and it, it was a risk. Like I was a little bit nervous, but, uh, as I said, like we are so close in Montreal and so casting has known me for a long time and they were respectful and appreciative actually. So it, the whole process went really well mm -hmm. and the appreciation out of the three sides is really good and we'll have another, another meeting eventually. Where, I'll be there. Yeah. Uh, your, your newest uh, big responsibility because you love putting more and more responsibility on yourself <laughs> is that um, you were voted in as now national actor president. Yeah. Um, that's a big deal. Um, it's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where to begin my questions on that because that's a, that is a big role. I guess how has the shift from being a vice president, well, you still are vice president of Actor Montreal, but you know, what, how has that changed your life? Because I'm assuming it means a lot more travel. It means a lot more being in the forefront of negotiations and, and, and all these kinds of things. You're much more of the face of how has that been? It's been an incredible journey so far. Thank God I love it. Um, it it's tough. It's a tough road. Uh, it happened very quickly, mm -hmm. actually, because... Uh, in, 27, in 2018, we went into IP negotiations, and that year was a big focus on hashtag me too. It'd come out of hashtag me too, and we wanted to change respect and consent. Yeah. And what are IP? Just to, the um, IP? The Independent Production Agreement. Okay. And uh, so it's our film and television agreement. Mm -hmm. And there were, at that time, Montreal had a spot for two counselors, and I was not one of those counselors national counselor. Mm -hmm. So it was Simon Peacock and Tristan DeLala. But Simon Peacock couldn't make it, and so I stepped in as his alternate. Uh, it was great timing for me because it was dealing with hashtag me too issues, and I was red hot on that and going into negotiations and being like, what is this? And I like this a lot. And I have a lot to say to the other side of the table about how we need to change things and what to do. And I guess out of that experience, it sort of um, brought a little bit of attention towards me. And then I started getting involved because people wanted me involved in more things on a national level. And then we changed our, um, our bylaws and constitution to 
allow, f we, across the country, we changed up the numbers of national counselors that were allowed and Montreal suddenly got a third spot. Mm. And so I was like, oh, 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 <laughs> got oh, me. oh, oh. And, uh, and Montreal council voted me in, which was so nice of them. And, uh, and then the next thing from there was our uh, national president at that time was, was going to be stepping down. And I sort of had it in the back of my mind about, hmm, I would really like to do this one day. I'd really like to do this. I would love to lead the negotiations. Okay, yeah. Well, why is that the, the, was the main draw for you, the idea of getting in and negotiating? Do you enjoy negotiating? And is that, or is it because you, you very strongly, like you had very strong opinions about what we as a union needed? Like, is it the... Is it the, was it the outcome that kind of drew you or was it the actual going in there and... It's the both. It's, it's the it, both. They, go, they go hand in hand. Bargaining, the bargaining process is essential to who we are as a union. It's essential to everything that we do, right? All our, all our complaints or all our issues or, or any time we feel unstable or insecure or, or, or not safe on set, that all has to do with bargaining and where, you know, the foundation of... of what we are as a union. So being in that room and seeing how challenging and difficult it was and the whole process of the things that are so important to us and for producers, um, for them, it comes from a different point of view. It mm -hmm. comes from a point of view of liability. Mm -hmm. And they want to avoid liability because liability costs money. So we should all be appreciative of the job we have. They sort of have some, you know, safe guideline fences in there. And uh, you're sort of paid okay. And we should all be happy. <laughs> and then we go, there's a heck of a lot of issues that you don't pay attention to. And we got to break down that liability wall that they have. And the more we break that down, the more protected we become. And the process is really, really interesting to get there because they're not evil people. Um, uh, we have a great partnership for the most part. They want to work with us. They respect actor performers across this country. So we already have that mm -hmm. as a base. And then we just need to go in there and, and chip away at the things that we really need. And I would say that uh, a lot in the past has been safety and monetization. And then when I went into my first bargaining in 18, I think more than ever it changed to respect and dignity on set. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole new thing for them because to, that, to them it was a concept. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, we, you know, everybody can do their best. And we're mm -hmm. like, doing their best isn't good enough. There's been so much um, bad behavior enabled in our industry, right? I mean, so much so that it's even basically bred a new role on set, which is the intimacy coordinator. Yes. I mean, that. Which is amazing. Yeah. Which is amazing. And I always laugh when I hear somebody say, but it takes away the spontaneity of, you know, the moment of the scene. And I'm like, there's almost nothing spontane <laughs> spontaneous on set. Mm -hmm. We have to walk to our mark. We have to talk to somebody's ear or yeah. shoulder or whatever where the eye line is. So sometimes I could be talking to you here and doing a whole love scene, not even looking at you like this. I mean, there's nothing spontaneous. So um, the intimacy coordinators have shared across this country and in detail and with the producers what they do. They are not interrupters. They are there to protect and help guide mm -hmm. and make the set comfortable, which is what every producer should want. And now we're getting more and more producers wanting that. And that is fantastic for actors. And pretty much everybody who uses an intimacy coordinator says what a difference it makes. Yep. And it's faster and more efficient. Right. And producers like that. Yes. Because yes, it saves we, them money. Yeah. <laughs> it all sounds very exciting. Lobbying sounds exciting, and and bargaining all sounds exciting. Um, I am sure being uh, the president and being the face and being whatever is not always rosy. Yeah. Um, what has been some of the uh, more difficult aspects of representing a union? Um, the responsibility is huge. Um, making sure I can speak on everything that we're dealing with. Uh, admittedly, when I, when I won the position, uh, 
you know, I did not know about everything of everything. So there was a lot of learning to do. Uh, I think I'm there now. A really hard thing is when we're in, when we're in bargaining and uh, we run into something like a lockout mm. and we have performers not earning a living for almost a year. We haven't stopped working. We are working on it constantly. Uh, my days are 12 hours long. They're nonstop. My phone is on me 24-7. <laughs> uh, yes, there is more travel. I have to hop on a plane way more often. It was slow at the beginning because we were, there was still no real travel across the country. But now that there is, that has changed things significantly. At the same time, I'm trying to maintain a career here because this is a two-year term. And um, I did put my name in to run again. But I, you know, I, I don't decide that. The National Council decides that. So I still have to go back if that if if I don't continue this or however long I continue this, there's going to be an end point, and I need to maintain my career because that is my true bread and butter. And so juggling all of that is a challenge, but uh, but I am on it and super committed, as is everybody at National. It's an incredible team that I work with mm -hmm. that cares about every actor and what we do for a living, and. The people at the helm are unbelievable. We have some of the best in the country. And we're going to get through this challenging time, as we do all times. And we're one of the best unions that gets the best agreements in the world. Mm -hmm. We're so well regarded via the Federation of International Actors. That's the, all the unions around the, country, the, the, around the world um, are, you know, this federation. And we come together once a year. I went to my very first one. And it was unbelievable to hear the conditions that many unions are in and around the world and how fortunate we are in Canada. Mm -hmm. And SAG-AFTRA and ACTRA were, you know, there's things that we're better at than SAG-AFTRA and AFTRA and other things. And we learn from each other and we coordinate and we... Right. And what do you think um, leads us to be in that position? Are our actors, are, are we a lot more together in solidarity is it is it coming from there is it coming from the leadership is it coming from the the producers being more willing to to res to listen and to budge like what what makes us so respected like what got us there I think we have extraordinary leadership I'm not talking about myself a previous that's mm -hmm. built a foundation that's gotten us to this place we have a great reputation and everybody loves Canada right Everybody loves Canadians. <laughs> they always regard us as being really nice. But we're also, we're easy to work with. We're hard to fight, easy to work with. Um, so I think that we have, we have incredible talent across this country. They recognize that. Mm -hmm. And we are constantly, I think our biggest uphill battle overall over everything is to keep the best, hottest Canadian talent in Canada. In Canada. Instead of always going to Hollywood to earn a living and then we claim them as our own. But we want to be able to have a sustainable market here and yeah. we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. What what can uh, what else do you think that can be done uh, to do that to keep people here? Well, we just passed Bill C11 which was huge. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have you know media giants paying into our industry here so we can produce here. Produce here. And we are working on making sure that the standards are equalized and that we get Canadian production, writers, directors, performers being Canadian and getting our Canadian stories out. And I think now more than ever, now more than ever, it is Canada's time to shine on the global stage. There's been this sort of weird belief that nobody wants to hear Canadian stories, and it's not true. We've proved it time and time again. We go Schitt's Creek and Kim's Convenience and Working Moms and um, Sort Of and all, all these incredible shows that are coming out, Transplant, uh, that are doing so well globally that are... This is it. This is our time. If the, the general membership um, uh, wants to be more active in in their union, in, in how, what kind of things can, can all those recent graduates listening yeah. right now, how can they be a part of, yeah. uh, of the solution? Easy. You get engaged with your local branch, find out what committees are 
are there, what, and then you'll find something for sure that'll suit you to be a part of. That's how you can start. Learn about the union. Um, that's a place where you can bring your questions to the forefront. Join whatever town halls we have. Come to the AGMs, our annual general meeting, AGM. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the best way to, to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's great to go and talk with your friends and complain, but bring that, bring that to the branch and, and let us hear it and let's talk about it and let's build on ideas and, and build on strengthening our talent here. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, everybody has a voice. It's a membership run uh, union, so. Awesome, awesome. Eleanor? Yeah. Thank you so much. Are we done? That's it. That's it. We're running out of time. <laughs> Thanks, Julian. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Look at that. Look how perfect the timing is. It says media and you're full. Oh, my God. Thanks so much for watching today's interview. If you want to check out the rest of them, head to the Out of Frame playlist. And if you want to support the channel, make sure you subscribe and like and leave a comment, share with a friend, all the usual stuff. So thanks again, and I'll see you at the next one.